Welcome to unit 8 and 9 from the laboratory manual for Bio 230 students. In these ch two chapters, we will talk about the skeletal system, specifically naming of the bones of the skeleton in unit 8. And unit 9 will cover articulations or joints. So we're going to talk about briefly the different types of joints that we have, the mechanistic support of the joints, and uh, certain information about the movements. Now, um, for the first unit, for unit eight, we're going to be looking at this skeleton. So you can zoom this out. You see uh, what it looks like. Essentially, we're going to use this 3D model, uh, trying to name the bones, trying to see where they're located. Now, uh, keep in mind that essentially for the skeletal system, there's around 206 bones in the human body. Now, whatever's happening on the right side, it's symmetrical to the left side. Now, for certain features, for instance, any kind of protrusions uh, from the bone, we call these processes. If there is an opening that looks like it's been drilled through the bone, we call that foramen or foramen for multiple. Uh, and again, if there are joints, uh, we call these articulations. And now, when you have a full skeleton with all the joints, this is a normal skeleton. And if the skeleton, if the bones were separated from each other, this would be a disarticulated skeleton. Now, first, we're going to look at the bones of the skull. Uh, we always start the skull kind of going from top to bottom. Uh, the skull has facial bones and cranial bones. Okay, so um, now for those areas, when we have regular joints, we call those synovial joints. And those joints, like in the skull, like right here, they're immovable, uh, where the bones do not move. Uh, these are called sutures. So we have um, coronal suture, um, sagittal suture, lambdoid suture, and squamous suture. So again, coronal, sagittal, in the back, lambdoid, and then squamous on the side. These are the main sutures of the skull. So again, this is essentially um, during embryological development when the skull of the fetus is forming, the skull, uh, the skull bones are coming together. They're gonna leave these open spots called fontanelles. And eventually at about uh, infancy or one year of age, the child's skull bones will come together and fuse, giving you these sutures. Okay, so when you look at the cranial bones, again, we have the frontal bone and parietal bones, one on each side. So, so this is the parietal bone on the right side, and then we have the parietal bone on the left side. Here we have the temporal bone on the side, and in the back we have the occipital bone. And again, obviously on this side, here we have the temporal bone as well, outlined in green. Now, what's unique about, uh, let's highlight the temporal bone again. Now here you see there's that opening for the ear canal, essentially. This is what's called external acoustic meatus or external acoustic opening, which would be normally be just an ear canal in a normal uh, body. And also just behind that right here where my finger is pointing, this is the mastoid process of the temporal bone, which is an important area, again, anatomically, this kind of a protrusion we call a process when if it's uh, occurring in a skeleton. And then when you're looking at from the back, from this area, the occipital bone, if we can kind of twist it, you'll see there's that opening there in the occipital bone, and that's the foramen magnum, that's the area through which the opening in the occipital bone where the spinal cord exits out from the brain to continue down through the spinal column. Okay, now when we go into this area, we see that over here is a sphenoid bone. We're going to see this bone, as you can see, in multiple locations, looking through the eye openings uh, on this side by the temporal bone, and actually if you open up the skull. 
Now, I cannot open up the skull in this in this uh, picture, but uh, if you were to do it in a real skeleton, you would see that uh, the sphenoid bone actually protects the pituitary gland. This area is called the cella torsica, deep inside the skull when you remove the brain. And so again, cella torsica, the protective bone, part of the sphenoid protects the pituitary gland. Okay, now um, let's continue with the face. So you're gonna kind of look at the facial bones now. So we have the bottom part, that's the lower jaw, that's the mandible. The upper portion is the maxilla or maxillary bone. The cheekbone is the zygomatic bone. And then when we come a little bit closer, we have the nasal bone here. The second one again, maxilla. Um, the third one is the lacrimal bone. Lacrimal is from tears. So uh, when tears are draining from the eye, they go into the opening in the lacrimal bone. And then the last one, the ethmoid bone there, or not the last one, but um, one of the deeper ones. And then the deepest is the sphenoid again. That's where the optic nerve Exit. So again, now for the ethmoid bone, just to get back to that, the ethmoid is important because when we're looking at, uh, again, opening up the skull, removing the brain, we see there's something called cribriform plate in the ethmoid bone, and that's the area where the olfactory nerve or the nerve for the sense of smell is going through. Okay, and again, how do you know it's the sphenoid over here? It's because that, there's that opening there for the optic nerve and some blood vessels there. Okay, there's your zygomatic again. And then in this area, you see looking through the nose, if you focus on this area, this is the vomer, this is basically the bony septum separating your nasal cavity from right and left. Okay. Okay. So we can rotate the skull again, take a look around. These are all the facial bones. Uh, now, something that's kind of hard to show here, but there's also palatine bone and the top palate or kind of hard palate, the roof of the mouth, if we were to kind of open the jaw, open the skull. Okay, so now let's progress further. We have this bone kind of suspended here. That's the hyoid bone. Okay, this is the only bone in the body not connected to any other bone. That essentially is... Um, helping the jaw open and close and connect it to the muscle, but not any other bone. So here, as you can see, it looks like it's kind of suspended in midair. Obviously in real life it would be actually connected to other structures, but not bones. Okay, so the next thing is, let's look at the vertebra. So we have lots of different vertebra. So now the first top two vertebra that we have here the atlas, C1, and axis, C2, these are named. The rest of the cervical vertebra, C3, C4, C5, C6, C7, are not named. They're just called cervical with the numbers. So we have seven cervical vertebra. Again, atlas and axis are the most important ones because they're holding up the skull. Now, below that, we have the thoracic region, so there we have bones that are T1 through T12. T1 through T12 thoracic. And then in the lumbar region, these bones here, these are L1 through L5. Now if we pick one of these and isolate it, like so, we can begin to kind of talk about what is actually going on with some of these features. Now, this is the best is the way to ex explain it actually using this. This is one of the largest vertebra. Again, remember vertebra are there to protect um, the spine, the spinal cord. So this rounded portion, that's the body of the vertebra. Remember intervertebral discs would lie on top and on the bottom, kind of sandwiching the bone. Okay, there are the cushions made of fiber cartilage that uh, allow for these joints to be flexible, flexible movements of the skeleton and the spine. 
uh, and kind of support the weight of the body. Uh, the parts that, so the rest, so basically when you're looking at this structure, so this is the rounded portion of the body of the vertebra, and then you have this pointy part here, that's the spinous process. These two are the transverse processes. These are articular processes, basically connecting uh, to other vertebra, or in some cases connecting to ribs, depending when you're where you're located. And these portions, these parts connecting the body of the vertebra to the rest of the structure are what's called pedicles. And then in this triangle, these two parts of the triangle are the lamina. Okay, and obviously the opening here, that's where the spinal cord is passing through. And that is the, essentially uh, the vertebral foramen or foramen. Now looking, let's come back to the rest of the skeleton here. Uh, so in the back, we have obviously our scapula. Uh, when we turn to this side, we have the ribs. Uh, this is the second rib, third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib, uh, and on, or 11th rib in this case, because I clicked on it, but uh, there are 12 ribs on each side. The last two ribs, 11 and 12, are floating ribs. So they're only connected to the posterior aspect of the spine. They're not connected in the front. Now those ribs, they are connected in the front, right? so they're missing some cartilage here, but essentially we have the sternum. The sternum consists of the body of the sternum, manubrium of the sternum, and the xiphoid process of the sternum. Okay, so keep in mind also that we have the clavicle. This is the right clavicle, left clavicle, obviously. Uh, so when you're looking at this area, so you have the ribs, you have the clavicles, and most of the Ribs, again, there are 24 ribs, 12 on each side, connect to the front with the cartilage, again, that they've kind of removed here, but and that's to the sternum, and the sternum consists of manubrium, body of the sternum, and xiphoid process. Now, looking at the upper uh, arm area, we have the humerus. And then we have the radius and the ulna. So keep in mind, right, there are two bones below the elbow, radius and ulna. And from shoulder to the elbow, we have humerus. Now, when you're looking at the hand, so essentially we have the carpal bones in the wrist. Okay, so bones there, they are named individually, but we're just gonna call them, group them together as carpal bones. And then we have metacarpal bones in the palm of your hand, and then the rest are the phalanges. Okay, so it's carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. And obviously, same thing on the other side. Now, just to come, come back to the spine a little bit. Uh, so there's this portion of the spine that's the sacrum. So after the L1 through L5 lumbar, there's also the sacral component, uh, which is also technically S1 through S5, but these are fused bones. And then the lowest portion is the coccyx, which is the tailbone, which is the remnant evolutionary from those animals that actually do have fully functioning tails with all the bones. In our case, it's just this remnant that doesn't do anything. Okay, now looking at the pelvis, right, we realize that there's a male type and female type pelvis. So the pelvis, um, essentially the main differences between male and female, you'll see that in the book, but essentially has to do with this pelvic inlet, how big this opening is, and the angle over here uh, by the pubic area. And the bigger this opening, the more rounded it is, the more likely that during childbirth, the baby's head will be able to pass through so for those women who have a normal gynecoid type pelvis, the female type pelvis, they have, they have no problem and it's easy to deliver the child. And there are some women that have an android type pelvis where it's more male type. And so the opening, this inlet 
is sort of more heart shaped and it's harder for the baby's head to pass through and so they might require a c-section for instance obviously for men this is irrelevant because men do not give birth uh, so they would not even sort of know what kind of pelvis do they have now so again looking at the pelvis from different connections in the sacrum we have these openings there these are sacral foramina to make sure that the nerves are passing through um, the pel uh, through basically the spinal nerves going into the pelvis itself to innervate all the structures there, like the muscles and nerves, uh, muscles and bones, sorry, and reproductive organs and organs from the urinary tract. So again, sacral foramina opening through the sacrum for those nerves. Then when you're looking at the bones themselves, so this bone is the ilium. This bone is the pubis or pubic bone. And when you rotate it this way, this bone is the ischium, that's the bones you sit on. Again, this is what they look like, right on this side also ischium. Um, and so again, this is the ilium, that's the, or the iliac large bones. Now also in this area, right at this angle is the ASIS, that's the anterior superior iliac spine, which is the point on the ilium. Uh, let's kind of highlight the ilium again. All right, so right about here would be ASIS, uh, anterior superior iliac spine. Um, and this is an important anatomical landmark, essentially, especially in medicine. Uh, now, when you're looking at this portion here, where the pubic bone is kind of part of it, and where uh, the femur, this bone here, goes in to the pelvis in that area, we have something called the acetabulum, that's kind of ball and socket arrangement. So the, the ball of the femur goes into the socket, the acetabulum, as part of the hip joint. And over here in the middle would be a cartilage called pubic symphysis that connects the two sides of the pelvis. Okay, now moving on down to the leg. Again, we have the femur. Femur is the largest bone in the body. Right? Remember, type of a long bone. And when you're looking here, you have the patella, that's the kneecap. And then we have the tibia. And the fibula. <clears throat> and then for the bones in the foot, kind of similar like in the arm. Remember we had in the hand, we had carpus, metacarpals, and phalanges. Here we have tarsals, metatarsals, and phalanges. Again, they do have individual names here, but essentially for us, right, we're just gonna call them tarsals, metatarsals, phalanges is fine. Okay. Now again, looking at the whole skeleton, again, when you're studying the skeleton, make sure you look at the, all the pictures, compare them um, to the diagrams, look, look at them through the textbook, through the lab menu and the computer if possible, and uh, kind of try to go through that list, try to memorize these names. Again, for the bones, all you have to know is the location of the bone, what the bone is named, right? We know what bones do, obviously they protect us, They allow the skeleton to function, they allow muscles to work together as part of movement, as part of the musculoskeletal system. Um, again, don't forget about the facial bones, cranial bones in the beginning, and then when you open up the skull, right, you see that cella tersica in the cribriform plate and the foramen magnum in the, like I said, uh, the occipital bone. All right, and then when you're looking at the spine, right, we have cervical bones, thoracic, lumbar, and then sacrum with the coccyx at the end. Okay. So again, let's look at the skeleton again, kind of zoomed out. Okay, we can kind of spin it around, see what it looks like. Okay, again, make sure you're reviewing all this information in the book. Now, to get into the unit nine information for the joints, 
essentially we have this information here from your nodes. All right, so we have unit nine. There are multiple different types of joints. So there are three classes of joints or articulations that we have. We have synovial, fibrous, and cartilaginous joints. Synovial are the most important types of joint. These are most of the joints in the body are, it's gonna be synovial, so like the knee joint, the hip joint, the finger joints, shoulder, on and on. And then two unique types are the fibrous, which are the sutures in the skull, and cartilaginous, which is just basically the ribs. So when you're thinking about the ribs connecting to the sternum, to the body of the sternum, right, those 12 ribs on each side, they're mostly connected through these cartilaginous joints, right, except I guess uh, 11 and 12, which are floating ribs only connected to the back. And then now when you look at the synovial joints, they are sort of a mechanistic way of thinking about them and meaning how do these joints actually connect? Now I can't show them right now, but essentially when you see them in that chapter, you see the diagrams. And so we have a plane type of joint, a hinge type of joint, a ball and socket, a condyloid, a saddle, and a pivot type of joint. So six varieties of synovial joints based on specific mechanical or mechanistic formation. So how do these bones essentially slide on top of each other? How do they move in that specific joint? Now, um, just to remind you that all synovial joints in general have a capsule, have articular cartilage, articular surface on the bone, often have ligaments or pretty much always have them, and even sometimes have menisci or meniscus if one, and something like the knee, which is additional support tissue made out of cartilage type material to support those joints. So the knees have a meniscus because right, your knees support almost essentially the whole weight of the body and the ligaments stabilize that joint. Uh, inside, you're also gonna have the synovial membrane with some liquid to, li liquid to reduce friction when the bones are moving on top of each other so that they don't cause arthritis or any kind of damage or inflammation of the joint. Now, looking at the synovial joints here, again, so the first one where this, the plane type of joint, this is where flat surface rubs against flat surface. This is what's called, or slides against it. So this is called basically plane. And the best example is the intercarpal area. So between the carpal bones, we have kind of flat surface. Remember carpal bones are kind of square like little bones. So the plane joint is the, is the most common type of arrangement there. Next, we have the hinge. Hinge is essentially kind of like a door hinge. So thinking of the elbow, the way that the radius and ulna, ulna move together with the humerus, the upper part of the arm, and the hinge-like movement in the elbow, so that's the hinge joint. Then we have the ball and socket, right? There's multiple arrangements we can see, especially in the shoulder, thinking about the humerus going into the joint of the made up by the scapula and the clavicle. Um, and also something like a hip joint, right, with that acetabulum that we talked about, the femur going into the acetabulum to make the hip joint, right, this also would be ball and socket arrangement. And then uh, we have a saddle type of joint. This is in the thumb, carpal metacarpal region, basically only for the thumb finger. Uh, in your hand, so where that connects between the carpal and metacarpal bones. And then condyloid is the metacarpal phalangeal is the best example. These are your knuckles in your hand, right? Basically the phalanges come together with the metacarpals in that joint. And the last one, pivot, is the proximal radial ulnar joint uh, in the arm. So meaning proximal, meaning uh, keep in mind that the radius and ulna come together in the distal area close to the wrist and then proximal closer to the elbow. So this is the one closer to the elbow, pivot type of joint. And then when we're thinking of the movements, these are different kinds of movements that are possible in the body. Again, you need to see this in picture form in the manual. Uh, uh, and essentially there are two main types of movements. These are flexion and extension movements right here. Uh, so. For instance, when you're looking at the hand, you can say, I'm flexing my fingers, extending my fingers. Okay, and these are common. You can do this for the wrist, you can do this You can for your hand, you can do it for many different areas, uh, or you can say this even kind of cervical movements 
with your move your head down to your chin you're flexing your neck and extending back your neck when you move your head drop your head kind of back um, for the other movements we have the less common besides flexion is just abduction is and abduction movements uh, if you're looking at my hand now, the fingers, if you abduct your fingers, you're kind of spraying them apart, abduct them, bring them back. You can do the same thing with the shoulder. You can say, move your arms away from your body. You're abducting your arms. And when you bring your arms back, you're abducting your arms. Again, abduction, abduction. Uh, less common movements, but it's still possible in many different areas, as you'll see in the book. And two others... Uh, examples is one is supination and pronation here and supination means you're essentially turning turning your palms of your hands to face up and pronation face the other way right so supination you supinate your arms so that they're facing up and when you turn your hand down that's pronation to pronate your hand supination pronation again mostly done just with the hands kind of that twisting motion possible because we have two bones between the elbow and the wrist, right? The radius and all the bones. That's why we have that flexibility. And the last ones, the dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is just with the foot. Dorsiflexion, when you push down with your foot, or sorry, uh, plantar flexion, when you push down your foot and dorsiflexion, when you uh, kind of raise your toes up with the foot. So dorsi Dorsi towards the back is up with the foot, plant or you plant your foot down, down with the foot. Um, again, for all these movements, uh, the, there is nice illustrations in this chapter to indicate to you uh, where and how do these movements occur actually with arrows on a, on a human diagram. Uh, make sure to take a, do, take a look at those. Again, remember flexion, extension, the most important one, ones because we can do this with most of the joints. And for the others, again, you just need to remember the examples, again, that I gave you. So again, supination just with your hands, abduction, abduction you can do just with your fingers, and then dorsiflexion, plantar flexion is only with your foot. Again, keep in mind, remember to review all of these notes as uploaded through Blackboard uh, and take notes on these videos uh, to study and prepare for exams.